Welcome back to our workshop. I've got a chair here that previously was repaired, but the repair has failed. Why did it fail? What mistakes did they make? I'm here to teach you about furniture repairs, so stick with me. I'll show you how to get this chair back in working order. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. What I need to do is take that apart, repair it, and put it back together so I can get this chair in working order. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. When I've got a piece of furniture like this that's so severely damaged, I like to learn as much as I can about how it was constructed so I can diagnose the problems. Fortunately, I've got four chairs in this set, and what I've done is I worked on the easiest one first. This is a chair that had two broken slats in it, so I've taken apart the other chairs, salvaged parts, and put it together. So I now have one fully functional chair. That's taught me about this chair, and I can now understand there are a few more things wrong with it than when I originally looked at it. The first thing I noticed on this chair was this part here is sheared off across the grain. Red oak is very strong, and the grain pattern here going up and down, this would be a lot of strength. So this didn't make sense to me. But then I noticed that this part here and this part here are sawn pieces of wood. They're not splintered off. Now watch this as I rotate the chair and bring it towards the camera. You see how flat the surface is? And if you follow that line down here, you can see the difference between a dark area and a light area. So this piece was actually cut, and this is two pieces of wood glued together. Now that I've found evidence of a repair here, I'm looking in other areas to understand where else it was repaired and what else might fail. This flat area here has a corresponding flat area on this slat. And I can tell here and here, these were both repaired the same way. They were cut on steep angles and then glued together. This is a good way to repair wood. Cutting on such a steep angle gives you a lot of gluing surface and can make a very strong joint. This one didn't stick. I also noticed that this mortise is fairly large. If I take a slat here that's original and put it in, you can see there's a lot of space. Now, admittedly, these are very small tenons for such a heavy chair, and this was probably the size that would have worked best for these chairs, but in this case, I can tell that this is a modification from the original. This mortise being larger wouldn't weaken the chair. But this part here that wasn't glued properly tells me the person that repaired this didn't know much about glue and they didn't clamp it properly. This glue joint also failed here. And when I feel this surface and the mating surface on this side, I can feel this is really rough. And you can't glue rough pieces of wood together. They have to be smooth for them to bond properly. So I know the person that did this didn't exactly know what they were doing, but it still doesn't explain why this sheared off. Let's take a look at the end grain and see what we can see. I'll lean this forward and that's not end grain. Looks like someone's reinforced this with a dowel. But this is the narrowest part of the turning. So on this part here, they didn't actually get the dowel through the part they wanted to strengthen. In fact, there's a hole there I can put my finger in and it looks like we're missing about 20% of the end grain, which would make this weaker. But there's also a flat spot over here. Now all these splinters here, this is how oak should break. What you see back here, it's flat. And if I pull that up to where it matches on the chair, you can see that this side here was the original and this part here was patched in. This part here that's flat is telling me that there was a previous break and someone smoothed it out, tried to glue it back together again, but you can't glue end grain to end grain because there's no strength. I've taken a Sharpie and I've colored off this wood here that was flat. This wasn't bonding at all. This dent here is where the hole was drilled for a dowel, but the dowel didn't actually extend through, so there was no strength there. So with these two sections of wood missing, you can really see how weak this was. So how do you repair such a severely broken piece of wood? Well, I'll tell you in a minute, but first I'd like to ask for your help. We're building this supportive community about furniture repairs, and my goal is to get our channel to 100,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. So if you could share our channel with someone else who'd like to learn about furniture repairs, that would really help out. So to repair this piece of wood, you can't actually repair it. You need to replace it. So I've got a turning I need to do here for both sides of this. We're gonna replace those, get them really solid, and then put them in here, stain them up, and finish them. Part of the challenge on this though is not just doing a turning, 
but doing a turning with a mortise in it. So this becomes a little more technical than just a regular turning.
This benchtop shave horse that I use is a really handy tool. A shave horse is a tool that allows you to clamp using your foot pressure and that frees up both your hands to do the work. If you're interested in building a benchtop shave horse like this, you can get the plans on my website. I'll leave a link in the video description below. The nice thing about this is it doesn't take up as much space as a traditional shave horse that you actually sit on. And for me, it's really important working in a small shop that I can tuck this away in a corner and it's out of the way. I can now move on to the staining process. What you've seen me do here so far is something called setting the grain. I paint it with a black paint and then sand it off. And what that's doing is giving me those dark lines that you normally see in oak. The next step is to match the color on the rest of the piece. So I prop up this piece here and that'll give me an idea of what I'm aiming for. Now I'm using a water-based stain. Now water-based stains, when I used them about 20 years ago, were difficult products to use, but the technology's come a long way. A professional finisher has taught me how to use this particular product to mimic old oak. So I'll apply this as thick as I need to get the color intensity I want, but I might have to come back over it a second time to get the depth that I'm looking for. The nice thing about water-based products is they just clean up with water, so they don't smell and they're easy to clean up. Now that the stain is dried, I'm putting on polyurethane. And the reason I'm using polyurethane is that's what's on the rest of these chairs. They were built 25 years or so ago, and polyurethane was a popular product in smaller shops. These were handmade chairs, so I'm using the same product on the new parts as what are on the old parts. I let the first coat of polyurethane dry on these, and I need to assemble the chair before I put the final coat on because there's a little antiquing that's required. Now, just a public service announcement, I've got a fine coating of dust across everything in my workshop because of the work at the lathe. So make sure that you're wearing a respirator. You can't wear a dust mask, it won't protect your lungs. And your respirator needs to be NIOSH approved, and it needs to be a P100. So you end up with pink filters like this, that's the standard to make sure you're not going to breathe in that dust, which can cause permanent damage in your lungs and reduce your breathing capacity. I'll set these aside. And now we can get to repairing the chair. Now I've shown a lot of videos on how to take chairs apart, so I won't spend time on this video showing that, but the most difficult part of taking this chair apart is getting rid of these uprights here because they're held on with a split tenon. So let me just lay some padding down. So I'll take these legs off first and then we can get to these parts here. Please give us a thumbs up so more people will see our videos. What we've got here are the ends of the tenons. These are through tenons because they're coming through this piece of wood and they're split. So there's a wedge that goes in here and that wedge forces this tenon to be wider and that's what prevents this piece from wanting to slip out and that top being disconnected. Now to remove a wedge like this, what you do is use a drill bit the same width as the wedge and then get it out. But because this is waste for me, all I'm really looking to do is get rid of that wedge, that pressure on here, so I can knock it out. So I've got a larger drill bit here. I'm just going to drill in a few different spots here and get rid of the wedge. And the technique I use normally is uh, going sideways to get rid of the wedge. So I'll just turn it in this way. But I'm just making a mess of this. The key thing I want to do is preserve the mortise here that I don't damage it. Okay, that should be enough that I can loosen that up. So we'll just see if I can loosen it from the edges a bit. And then I use a dowel here to try and knock it out. There we go. Now unfortunately on this side I've drilled this out but it's not coming through. This was put together with modern glue and there's been no play in here so it's solid, it's not moving. So instead of just driving it out like this, I'm going to have to drill this out. Now, if you've seen my video on how to remove dowels, you'll understand how this works. Essentially, drilling a hole as wide as possible without damaging the mortise, and then breaking everything out from there.
Now because I have to break out this material here, it's going to be much easier if I cut this off here and then this structure here isn't helping holding it together. As I'm breaking this out in the middle, I noticed right here, there's actually a previous repair as well, a little bit of a split. And this is what can happen if you try to drive that tenon up without releasing the wedge. You end up splintering the top here because that wedge is fatter and it needs to put the pressure somewhere and it splinters out wood. What I'm trying to do is get to the natural edge of this mortise. So I've got the original dimensions and a nice clean opening. But you can see the glue residue around here. This is definitely glued in here with a PVA, so this has become very difficult. And this is why when repairing furniture, especially antique furniture, it's best to use a liquid hide glue because that liquid hide glue can be reactivated and loosened up. It allows you to gently take pieces apart when you need to. If we turn this over, it should be easier to split from this side. Yeah. So there's a little bit of gap around this part here. So you can see how it just comes out more cleanly here. Seems like maybe there was just a gob of glue right at the top there. And uh, it's going to take a little bit of work to get that cleaned up properly. You can see I've got a nice clean mortise on the inside there. I've got some more to chip away here. I'll do that and then we're ready for the next step. So with this all cleared out now, I can test fit this. Oh, that's loose. Okay, well, I turned that a little too thin. So I'll have to make that thicker. Be sure to go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter for links to new videos, workshop tips and more. Now back to fixing furniture.
I've got thick shavings of poplar. And what I do is glue them on here with PVA, secure them with elastics, and that widens this, and then I can file it down to fit. I'll set this aside to let that glue dry and I'll start to work on the back. So what I need to do here is because these two pieces are broken I need to remove the crest rail and they seem pretty locked in there. Let's just see with the spreader clamp if I can get them apart. No. So I think when this was repaired, it was likely PVA glue that was used. The joint here and here is pretty tight. So I'm going to have to break this off to preserve that crest rail so I can use it in this repair. I'll scrape off the old glue here so I've got bare wood and then we do a test fit. I can now fit the tenon in the mortise here and I actually made it a little bit too short so I just have to trim the tenon up at the top here and we should have a good fit. So I'm going to put this together. I've got a nice snug tight fit. There's a little area there and there that needs some touch up before the glue up though. The glue is now cured on this tendon so I can take the elastics off and start working it into the joint. Now in the meantime I had worked on this chair here. This is the fourth of the chairs. I'd taken a few of the remaining unbroken slats out of here to repair the first two. So here I replaced all four. And I did that so that all four are consistent on the back of this chair and you don't see some new ones, some old ones. It's a little easier to disguise repairs that way. I've set the grain on these and I used a shape horse to create these. These are parts here that you can't create with a machine. So you need to use hand tools for that. And a draw knife allows you to create these gentle curves and really get that rounded part at the bottom. It's one of the original tools that chair makers use even today. I'll take the elastics off this and you can see how the shavings glued up. So I generally put one elastic around each of the shavings as I put them on. You can see there's one, two, three, and there's the fourth one under here. Sometimes the elastics stick a little bit to the glue, but for the most part, they can be reused. And I keep the shavings in this container here. I made these uh, years ago. These are just poplar shavings, but they're really thick shavings. So they're perfect for this application. So now what I'll do is see how it fits. Okay, so it's fitting about there. I'll mark it with a pencil. So I do need to shave it down a little bit. And what I'll do is use a file for that. So I just work away around with the file and feel where there are raised areas. Here it looks like there was a little bit of an overlap between the uh, shavings, so that might be what it's hanging up on. That's pretty snug, but I like that tight fit. Once I put hide glue on there, 
that'll go in a little bit easier. Now if you remember the pieces I took out, they had a split tenon, and what I need to do is cut that split in the bottom here, but I need to orient it the right way first. So I need to make sure that these pieces here are lined up, the mortises for the back. Now the split in the tenon has to go perpendicular to the grain. So the grain is running this way, the split has to happen this way. And the reason that is, is if I put the split the same direction as the grain, it would split the seat as I apply pressure. So you need to make sure that the pressure from the split is against the end grain. I simply put a ruler across the center of both of these and then draw my line. I'll turn this upright and before I take these out I want to mark right and left. So on here I've got marking as to where these parts go. I'm just going to take this label and put it on this one. One. Wow, that's really tight. Okay, and there's the other. This is the tenon that I had drilled out, and you can see the split goes about three quarters of the way down the tenon. I'll just use a dovetail saw and cut this. So that's what the cut looks like. I'll just rotate it a bit and you can see that gap. Just enough to get a wedge in there and start driving that apart to make a nice secure joint. There are a couple different ways to make wedges and I've got a video that shows those. I'll show you one technique here. I just break off a section of birch and then what I do is take that into the small wedge maker and I plane down one side, flip it over flip it over and there I've got a wedge shape. I've got my wedges ready, I've got PVA glue for this break here the high glue is warmed up now, so we're all ready to assemble. I'm using old brown high glue. This is a glue that needs to be warmed up before you use it. I thought I'd give it a try, haven't used it yet. So with this glue, what I'm doing is putting it on the back of my brush and putting it inside the mortise. Now it's really important that you put glue on the tannin and the mortise to maximize any possible areas where you can get a, a strong glue bond. I see manufacturers where joints have failed and all they do is squirt a little bit of glue on one side and hope it's going to hold, but that's not a good strategy. So I'll put this in the mortises here. I'm also putting it in the mortises on chair back here. This is where the crest rail goes in. And the reason I'm using high glue on these chairs, they're not antiques, but the problems I've seen with the slats breaking, I imagine at some point in the future this will have to get repaired again. And this will just make it easier for the next person because high glue is reversible, which means you can heat it up or you can use white vinegar to break down the protein, loosen up the glue, and you can take everything apart without damaging it. You can't do that with PVA glue when it's glued well. Okay, so those pieces are glued with high glue. This is a broken slat here that's staying in place. And I'm using PVA glue because I want a permanent bond for that. So I'll just brush this on and get it ready to assemble all the parts. With glue and all the mortises, I'm not going to work on the tenons. 
quickly apply glue to each of those. Again, I make sure I've got glue on every surface that's going to be mating. So it takes a little bit of extra time and I use an artist brush for this because it allows me to spread the glue and make sure I've got those surfaces covered. Now, I don't think I warmed up this glue quite enough. It's a little bit congealed, a little bit like what you'd see the fat on top of cold gravy. Okay, and this one is going over here. And as I mentioned earlier, it is easier to put parts in place once you've got hide glue on them. It, it lubricates them. So this one that was really difficult to get in before should slide in nice and gently. Wow, that's really jelly-like. Now my workshop right now is about 10 degrees Celsius. So it is cold, but I thought I had warmed that up enough. I'll just put that back in there. Okay, so that's going to go in well. Now I can't put it all together yet because I need to get the crest rail on. So I've got glue there. I need to add glue back here, a little bit of PVA to this broken slat. And again, spreading with the brush to make sure I've got glue on every surface. Now, the other uh, high glue that you can use is by tight bond. It doesn't require heating at normal temperature, but in a workshop right now that I'm in 10 degrees Celsius, it does require heating as well. It's, it just congeals too much to be able to use it straight out of the bottle. Okay, now we can turn it over and focus on putting these wedges in. Put glue on one side of the wedge. Glue on one side is what I've learned from Curtis Buchanan as a chairmaker. Put that in and then tap it in. Now listen to the sound. As I tap this in, you hear it getting more solid. There, that sound that at the end, that's in all the way. So I'll just let that dry and then trim that off after. I can now turn this right side up again. And then the last part, is clamping this together just to make sure I've got nice tight joints. Okay, so I'll clean up the joints just to wipe off any excess glue and then move on to this chair. And the reason I'm working on these two in a pair is because this, these two pieces that I turned here are going to look a little bit newer than the rest. So I want to be able to compare the two and antique them a little bit, wear them down. So they're not looking like brand new pieces.
The glue is now dried in your chair so I can take the clamps off. And the stain on these is really coming along. These were all the broken slats that were on the set of three other chairs. So I've got a coat of polyurethane to put on here. But as I mentioned before, I want to do a little bit of aging on these pieces here before I put the second coat of polyurethane on these. And I'll show you that in a minute. But first, I need to flip this over. And trim off these wedges. So I use a flush cut saw. This is made by Gyokujo. Really good quality saw. It cuts these off really nice and easily. Just like that. Okay. Set this up right. And unfortunately on this one, I couldn't take all the legs off. So what I can do is just block it up so we can take a look at the finish. Now we'll stack this chair on top of this one. This is the one with the two new turn parts and you can see the difference here in the finish. Now the customer didn't want to refinish these chairs but you can see here there's some wear marks. What I need to do is mimic those wear marks here on the matching parts just so that this new piece will blend in with all the other chairs. The polyurethane is now dried on these pieces here and they're looking great. On these slats here, they've only had one coat and they need one more to match the sheen on the slats that had broken. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll glue the under portion here, but the jury's still out for me whether I like the old brown or the tight bond high glue. If you're interested in a direct comparison between these two, let me know in the video comments below and maybe I'll make a video on that. I've also got a big mess to clean up here from the lathe, all the shavings, and a lot of dust in the shop. After I get everything cleaned up, we'll take a look at the before and after of this chair. Well, that's a nice clean lathe. It's really difficult to control dust and debris at the lathe, and I've got an upcoming invention I can't quite show you yet, but it will control a lot of the mess that happens in a workshop. I'm really looking forward to it. These chairs are all set to go here, so let me give you a close up of the parts that I replaced on these, and I'll give you a before and after photo as well. These are the two new pieces that I turned here, and you can compare it to the old one that was there. This is the one that had broken, so this was a scarf joint and it's a woodworking joint that uh, normally holds but this was not glued properly plus there was a pocket in there that someone had drilled a hole so that weakened the structure of this as well and on this chair i had to replace all four slats i made them on the shave horse and you can see how well they match on the old ones this chair is now back in working order If you enjoyed the wood turning aspects of this video, I encourage you to check out my other channel, Home Improvement Woodworking. That's where I teach woodworking skills and I've got videos on how to purchase your first lathe and some introduction to wood turning tools as well. If you'd like to support our fixing furniture community, you can help us get to our 100,000 subscriber goal by the end of the year. Please subscribe and share this with others to help build the supportive community around furniture repairs. Thank you for watching Fixing Furniture. <music>